Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Policy Committee. I have no particular announcements uh, apart from the usual to say that the meeting will be webcast live and recorded for repeat viewing also. Item two, do we have any declarations of interest? Good, wonderful, thank you very much. Item three, it's in the closed session, mate. Um, I know my role better than the monitoring officer. Minutes of the previous meeting. Any comments on those? No, are we okay to agree those is the correct record? Wonderful, thank you very much. On to item four, petitions and questions. We have one petition, one public question. So we'll take the petition first, uh, which is entitled Article 4, Direction for St Bartholomew's Road. And it is from Hilary Kemp, but we have two people sat at the front to present. I can't remember how much time you have, so I'm going to turn quickly to Simon, who will remind me. Three minutes. So you have three minutes to present. Over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello. We are residents of St Bartholomew's Road, myself for 23 years, Kate for 31 years and Dom for 40 years. Over those years, we've seen many changes in St Bartholomew's Road, some for the better and some not so. The road and houses were built by George Palmer with the principle of housing families and it's in a unique position fronting Palmer Park and cemetery, Reading Old Cemetery at the back. St Bartholomew's Road is also within walking distance of at least three junior schools and three senior schools. Our road consists of 56 Victorian built two or three bedroom, mainly terraced properties. The nature of these houses makes any further development of such housing stock into houses of multiple occupation inappropriate. Currently of those 56 houses, we believe six are already licensed HMOs, which represents approximately 10% of the road's housing stock. The other homes are either rentals or owner occupied. So we request two things from the council. We ask that the council use the powers it already has and already done so in the local area with an article four to keep the current range of housing on St Bartholomew's Road as it currently is. This we feel is an appropriate mix. We also asked the council to take note of the large amount of support we have from the residents via the petition, our covering letter, personal statements and other documentation submitted in support of limiting the number of HMOs in our small community. Lastly, there is no doubt that we need good quality family homes in Reading. We currently have those in St Bartholomew's Road, right by the park for families to enjoy and close to local schools. Let's not lose any more family homes. Let's protect what we already have and quickly. We hope you consider this favourably. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for the petition. If I could just ask you to turn the mic off if you just press the button in the middle. Thank you very much. And I have Councillor Lang to respond. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Hilary, and also Kate. I think it's Dom, did I hear that right? And I see Councillor Williams sitting in the in the public gallery as well. Um, um, I read your petition and your supporting letters, 56 signatures, I think, with 56 homes. That's, 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 that's not a bad petition. So, um, yeah, thank you for this petition. We acknowledge the strength of feeling in the road demonstrated by the petition and the supporting information and understand the issues that have been raised. The council recognises that some areas in Reading represent particular hotspots of houses in multiple, occupa in mo multiple occupation HMOs and that this can cause issues in the local area. In particular, the council is concerned about the loss of existing mixed and balanced residential communities in parts of Reading, family housing, etc. In terms of planning control, HMOs fall into two types. Large HMOs with seven or more unrelated occupants fall within their own use 
class. Sui G Generi, I think it's pronounced. Um, that was asked, Councillor Rowland, if that correct pronounced there, and, and she assured me. I always, I always think of it just we, but it's not completely wrong anyway. So, right, apologies, I'll move on. And always require planning permission. Small HMOs are between three and six unrelated occupants fall within C a C4 use class, and the government has permitted development rights in place to allow dwelling houses to be converted into small HMOs without the need for planning permission. A local planning authority can remove these rights by making a legal direction under Article 4 of the General Permitted Development Order known as an Article 4, an Article 4 direction, meaning that conversion to small MHOs within the area subject to such a direction would require planning permission. That does not mean that the application would be refused, but allows for the impacts of the proposal to be considered and assessed against planning policies. Due to the Council's concern, concerns about the impact of the proliferation of HMOs, an Article 4 direction came into force in much of Park, Park Redlands and Coatsgrove wards back in May 2013, which has meant a need to apply for planning permission to convert a dwelling house to a small HMO in those particular areas. The northern boundary of this direction at least in Park Ward, is London Road, Wokingham Road and Palmer Park Avenue. St Bartholomew's Road lies just outside the direction area. Information assembled in producing the Council's recently adopted Residential Conversion Supplementary Planning Document, SPD, indicates that St Bar Bartholomew's Road does have a relatively high concentration of HMOs. The census area within St Bartholomew's Road sits Sits, contains around 19%, I think you mentioned 10% in 2021, according to this information. Whilst this is lower than some of the greatest concentration, concentrations, which can exceed 30%, it is ne nevertheless comparable to or higher than many areas which are within the Article 4 direction area. It is therefore accepted that there is a good case for considering the extension of the direction area to include St Bartholomew's Road, as well as neighbouring neighboring areas in a similar position, most notably the northern side of London Road opposite Palmer Park, subject to further evidence gathering. However, undertaking an Article 4 direction is not a straightforward process. National policy states that a direction should be necessarily to protect the local amenity or the well-being of an area be based on robust evidence and apply to the smallest geographical area possible. I think that word they flush up is granular. Gathering this evidence can be considerable, can take a considerable time. And once the direction is made, there is a further 12 month period which comes into force to avoid paying possible compensation to landowners. At this stage, the council's planning team is preparing a partial update of our local plan as agreed at Strategic Environment and Planning Transport Committee set on 23rd of March 2023. It is a statutory duty of the Council to ensure that a full set of up-to-date planning policies are in place to guide development and ensure such as climate change, housing need and a formal affordable housing provision and this will also include a policy covering conversions of houses to HMOs across the whole of the borough. It is not therefore sadly envisaged that that work can begin on progressing a new or amended Article 4 until late in 2024. However, at that stage, the Council will investigate and a case for extending the direction in this area in full. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lang, and thank you to the petitioners. I'm sure there might be things that you want to follow up with Councillor Lang or indeed with your ward councillors, but we do acknowledge receipt and, and I hope that Councillor Lang's response is helpful to you. So thank you very much for coming this evening. And that moves us forward to public questions. We have one public question this evening and it is from James Rutland. It's not here. Well, in which case, uh, Mr. Rutland will receive the written reply prepared by Councillor McEwen, but I shan't force you to read it out loud. Uh, and we'll progress onwards then to agenda item uh, five, which is the Household Support Fund four. And I have Gavin Hanford, the Assistant Director for Policy, Performance and Customer Service to present.
Good evening. Thank you. Um, yes, the report before you tonight sets out the proposed arrangements for allocating the £2.26 million funding under the Household Support Fund. Um, unlike previous rounds, uh, funding has been allocated for the full year to run to the end of March 2024. Proposals have sought to maintain the provision from previous rounds while expanding the application element to ensure that most those most in need can get the support they need. As the application process has a wider remit and a larger budget, demand is difficult for us to predict. Um, therefore, you'll see in the report that we have included contingency allocations so that we can meet higher demand if required or to raise awareness of the funding if demand is lower than anticipated. Um, in recommendation three, you'll see that a decision was taken by myself under officer delegations to utilise part of the funding to set the scheme up and to make initial payments to those families um, with pupil premium ahead of the school summer holidays so that they had that in good time uh, and those vouchers have been issued. Uh, the committee is asked to approve a delegation under recommendation two to ensure that we can keep the scheme flexible to meet any changes in demand and compliance from DWP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Director. I had an indication from Councillor Terry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to say that uh, welcome the report. I think it sort of there wasn't time in previous rounds to really bring forward to Committee of the Public uh, the thinking and rationale around the decisions to allocate this funding. So I think this report does do this. Um, in terms of we've already got on with it, I think it's important to note we didn't wait for the committee. We needed to get on with it to make sure that families and children are supported as we approach the, the summer holidays. So 386,000, just over 386,000 pounds of vouchers, which of course are cashable. I think that's really important as well. Um, then go to the post office and cash those have gone out to those who are eligible um, automatically under our scheme for people pe pupil premium. Yeah, <laughs> and free school meals. Um, and I think in the next week or two, we're about to do another round of about £115,000 of vouchers for uh, other families in the same criteria, but also for care leavers. And it's important to note that care leavers are going to get some support very soon as well. Um, for the other categories, there's a second round in November for this group, uh, this cohort, and also for older people who have housing benefit, but no other support from DWP, they'll get their, their money sometime in late autumn, probably before November round, um, just so to note that so committee has a sort of idea of the timetable. As Mr Hanford has said, um, the previous allocation uh, criteria was met by Commission through the utility scheme with Citizens Advice Reading. It's a much larger proportion now, which we really welcome because we know that there are other people who are struggling with the cost of living that don't meet those criteria and we want to make sure that we've set up uh, a scheme uh, that's available for them to make an application, which of course does mean we need some dedicated staff and other resources. And, you know, we are allowed to take a reasonable amount for some admin support. And we've been thoughtful about that, um, both in terms of setting up systems and procedures, but also holding some contingency, because what we don't know is whether there'll be high demand or not. And we need to be able to be flexible about that, which has all been set out, I understand, you've just heard, but just to make sure that we can respond to demand and if we're not getting applications through that we've got some provision in order to go out there and do some work to promote it and make sure that people don't miss out. Thank you Chair. Thank you Councillor Terry. Councillor White. Thank you Chair uh, and yeah thanks for the report. Uh, we Green Councillors welcome the support outlined in the report. Uh, we should be helping everyone uh, at the moment through the cost of living crisis. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, it, this is just a small sticking plaster over what are massive cuts that the Conservative government has inflicted on our residents uh, year after year after year. Uh, but it's definitely going to be appreciated by the residents that, that receive this support. Uh, I, did, I did have one question that I, I emailed in advance but didn't get a response. I, I was slightly concerned about the, the promotion slash contingency line uh, being lumped in together at 100,000 on something that's 2.3 million, which could, could potentially be quite a lot with spending on promotion. So I, I did ask if there was an idea of how much we were spending on promotion, or is it nothing to start off with and then we might spend some of that money later? I don't know if you could uh, answer that question. Thank you very much. 
I'm, I'm happy to answer that. It, it is exactly that, really, it's a contingency. The promotion element is if there's not enough take up, we need to make sure that we put some dedicated resource into assisting our own staff and obviously voluntary sector to make sure that people are getting access to this in the application form. The other thing we don't know, because so we couldn't decide how to bill it exactly, is that we don't if there's high take up, you know, then we might need some more money. So it's there as a contingency as well. So splitting it is difficult to say because if the take up's good and we just need to use it to, to meet demand, we won't use it in, any for promotion because we won't need to because we'll know that people know about it and are making applications. So that's why it's difficult to actually break that down. But just to reassure you, really it's a contingency to note that we may have higher demand maybe at the beginning and we can't be certain you know that we could let me be clear the government expects this to run for the whole year so we, we need to make sure we're not just running out because people may later in the year find themselves when fuel costs go up again energy costs go up again they may then find themselves in you know the situation where they could benefit from this and we want to make sure that we don't spend it all at the front end and that we have some provision available for people later on Councillor Barnett Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wanted to welcome that this time with this round, we've been able to be more thoughtful and bring forward a more agile method of distributing this money, as so often has been the case with this government. Uh, recent, previous rounds have been released at quite short notice. You've had to rush things out very quickly. So some broad brush decision, decisions have had to be made. Uh, from working in the local voluntary sector, that sometimes attracted some um, complaints. I know people were concerned that uh, disability in some previous rounds wasn't set out as a eligibility. Whereas if we look here in Appendix 2, that is the listed as one of the types of people that it's expected would be uh, eligible for the application based scheme. I'm also personally really pleased to see the special support for care leavers. They are our corporate children, as I say, in, in many <laughs> different committees and acknowledging that they don't necessarily have the family networks that can help them get through difficult times that other people have. So I'm really pleased to see this and I think this is going to be, I would agree with Councillor White, it's not enough money, it's never enough money. Um, but I'm pleased with this method of distributing it and I think we've got a really good opportunity here to target these funds in a way that the previous allocations didn't allow us to do. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, like the other councillors, I welcome this and thank the officers and the lead councillor for the uh, the work and for the uh, the fact that this is flexible and agile in terms of its approach, I will be supporting the recommended action. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Yes, I just echo what my fellow councillors have said, and um, particularly um, welcome the, um, the this new addition of the application that can be made by anyone in need. And just and I realise it's difficult to reach everyone, and obviously it was difficult. Not everybody took their um, allowances in the past year and just to ask to take up to think particularly about the digitally excluded either because they're not using or the various online paying attention to what's online or possibly as well you do mention the communities that um, you know for whom English isn't a first language you know maybe you know just trying to think of those people that we're not reaching at the moment so I acknowledge that that's not an easy thing to do. Thank you Councillor Thompson. Councillor Terry, was there anything you wanted to come back on? Uh, no, just welcome the support for the scheme. I think that's the whole point of it being flexible, is that we know people didn't necessarily take up before and do our best to do that, but it's difficult to predict and we built in the flexibility in the recommendations, Chair, to make sure that we can make some changes to the scheme as we go forward to make sure that everybody who does need help can get help. Thank you, Chair. Wonderful, we're not detecting anybody who's uh, averse to this. I'm assuming we're unanimously agreeing the recommendations then. Great, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Assistant Director. Moves us on to item six, the SIP for practical guidance for local authorities on audit committees. And we have Paul Harrington, our Chief Auditor, to introduce. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everybody. So 
purpose of this report is to provide a summary of the key points arising from the updated SIPFA guidance for audit committees and provide members of this committee with the outcome of the self-assessment which was carried out, out by my um, internal audit team against the um, best practice guidance. So SIPFA usually provide updated guidance once every five years with the last guidance published in 2018. This new guidance um, was in response to the recommendations made following the Redmond review, which was an independent review carried out by Sir Tony Redmond into the effectiveness of external audit and transparency of financial reporting in local authorities. That report was published in September 2020. Whilst this is guidance, um, SIPFA expects that all local authorities should make their best efforts to adopt the principles aiming for effective audit committee arrangements. So the detail of the guidance is provided in section two of the report, so that's page 26 to 30. Some of the more noteworthy changes are bullet pointed in the executive summary under paragraph 1.6. So we also carried out a self-assessment that is in um, appendix two, page 37 to 45. And if I refer to that self-assessment, um, we use that the SIPFA um, description and methodology for the self-assessment. So we are what we call banging in the middle, which I would expect us to be. Um, if you look at the self-assessment and the way um, SIPFA has scored it, I'm not going to be uh, cynical in any way, but um, to, to fully comply, you have to score five out of five for every single category. And given its new guidance, um, I don't think any local authority who have done this properly will have scored um, five out of five on every category. So somewhere you're going to you're going to fall, fall in the middle. So we fall and bang in the middle with moderate improvement required. So the Audit and Governance Committee is a key component of our governance framework. Its purpose is to provide an independent and high level focus on the adequacy of governance risk and control arrangements. And it's my job to provide that assurance to the committee. Personally, I think that in my and in my opinion, we follow best practice um, and we cover the core areas any audit committee should cover. One of the main outcomes from the initial self-assessment review conducted was to propose that the audit committee's terms of reference be updated to those suggested by SIPFA, which um, is in appendix one of the reports. What the terms of reference do is really to formalise what the Audit and Governance Committee already does, with the exception that they remove its decision making powers in relation to the approval of the annual financial statements. This is because although the committee may be delegated some governance responsibilities, it should remain an advisory committee and not have delegated powers. So the recommendations. Um, recommendation one, this committee considers the key points arising from the audit committee um, practical guidance. And as I say, the main noteworthy changes are in the bullet points under paragraph 1.6. Um, the committee recommends to council the revised audit and governance committee's terms of reference, which are in appendix one, and the removal of its decision making powers in relation to the approval of the annual financial statements, returning the later to full council. The, um, also recommend that the policy committee endorses the recommendations of the Redmond Review and that the external audit annual report should be submitted to full council by the external auditor. And recommendation four, the policy committee recommends the council that the audit and governance committee reports annually on how it has complied with the SIPFA position statement, discharge its responsibilities and includes an assessment of its performance. The report should be made available to the public. Any questions? Thank you very much, Chief Auditor. Councillor Terry. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I don't really have very much to add to Mr. Harrington's uh, uh, 
overview of the report. I think we need to welcome the SIP for guidance, but it's SIP for guidance. Um, and we can see where our assessment has got us. And I think that, you know, we need to change the terms of preference. That's right. We need to make sure that's clear. Um, <clears throat> but I think really what we do is note where we've got to in terms of our partial and moderate need to improve and work through that over the, the next year or so and consider how we move towards compliance, but maybe not in every case as, as SIPRA recommends, but we can also ask our colleagues in order in governance to consider the best way forward on some of those matters as they come through. And a, a meeting of audit and governance just next week to think about some of these things and with a, a very stable membership, which is I know something that the chair of audit and governance was keen to have as well. Seen any other indications? Oh, Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you, Chair. This is um, just to check. So do I understand right that probably further discussion of things like whether or not the committee should uh, include some co-opted independent members that that could be would be looked at in more detail in the audit and governance committee. Yeah, I think we we would appreciate um, coming out of the audit and governance committee a, a sense of itself, a self assessment of members and their abilities, and whether there's a desire to have independent members uh, included there on, and where we come is probably not compelling for that, but we accept that you know there could be a role, and that that role might depend on the members who are on the committee and, and their particular kind of attitude around skills and training. Um, so I'm sure you'll have a discussion as a new member of audit and governance on the committee next Thursday. So I've really built it as an exciting evening that everybody should look forward to. Anybody else? No? In which case I'm detecting probably that everybody's unanimous about the guidance. Yes, good, wonderful. Well, we'll look forward to having a, a, a further report to the council meeting in October as well then. Thank you very much, Mr. Harrington. And moves us to item seven, the food service plan 2023 to 24. Do I have Katie Heath? Yes, coming from the public gallery to present. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the food service plan 23-24 uh, is the annual service plan for the food and safety team covering our statutory and additional work relating to food hygiene and food standards. The council is required to produce a food service plan annually. Um, this is required by the food law code of practice set by the food standards agency and the plan has been drafted in accordance with the code of practice and any relevant statutory provisions. The service plan provides a summary of food hygiene and standards work achieved since, um, well, sorry, throughout the year 22, 23, as well as comparison data from previous years. The plan also summarizes any work that was not completed and remains outstanding. Um, the plan also includes a review of progress against last year's wider work plan, which can be found in appendix four. The service plan outlines the remit and work required of the council in relation to food hygiene and food standards for 23, 24 including the number and type of premises that require statutory proactive inspection in accordance with the Food Law Code of Practice. In 22-23, the Council was required to have regard for the Food Standards Agency's recovery plan following the pandemic. Um, the recovery plan period has now ended and the FSA have reverted to work as usual. Um, all statutory food hygiene and standard requirements are detailed within the Code of Practice. Um, RBC were unable to meet all the outlined requirements of the recovery plan. Um, this is detailed within the food service plan and the covering committee report. In addition to food hygiene and standards requirements, the food um, and safety team have a much wider remit, um, which for example includes health and safety, special treatments and sports ground safety. Um, the full remit of the, um, the work of the team can be found um, within Appendix 5 of the Food Service Plan and that includes um, estimated resources that are required for this work to be completed. Um, the team's work is being prioritised in line with the corporate plan priorities and statutory requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor McEwen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thank officers for um, this report for the food service plan for 
23, 24. It's a really, um, it's a really detailed report and it's really helpful. Um, I'm sure for colleagues as well to read through. Um, colleagues reading the report will notice um, there's mention of the backlog inspections as highlighted and as mentioned. Um, obviously, background information there. In the last um, 10 years, I think we've had 400 premises, which is a huge number, and over a thousand um, um, organisations producing or selling food. And 2023 saw a 6% increase in the number of food premises as well. So, you know, as highlighted in the report, there's been um, a huge increase in services. I think the good news that um, the team are currently recruiting staff to assist with any backlogs as um, detailed and currently advertise. We have um, advertised, reported, uh, advertising for um, an environmental health officer full time and also a full time apprenticeship to help, which will hopefully reduce and um, reduce pressures on the service. So thanks for the report. Thank you, Councillor McEwen. Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I was pretty concerned when I read this report. To be honest, just that was someone that eats out in Reading from, from time to time and, and makes use of the uh, the very good scores on the Doors website to to sort of check out how what the food hygiene is like at, at one of our uh, many wonderful uh, restaurants uh, and decide to help decide where to eat and where not to eat. Uh, so yeah, with the the report uh, detailing uh, the, the backlog, I think there's eight hundred. Th thank you to Katie Heath for, for getting back to me to, to clarify some of the, the numbers. Uh, the backlog, I think, for food hygiene is eight eight hundred and fifty two premises. Backlog for food standards, nine hundred and five premises or due an inspection. Uh, the scores on the doors is if, if, if it's a zero, which we have some of in Reading, uh, my, my Google tells me uh, health at immediate risk and food unsafe to eat. So clearly uh, we want to be getting out and want to be inspecting uh, as many of these premises as possible to, to make sure that we can to raise the, uh, the, the standard of, of food uh, hygiene in in reading and reduce the chances of people being uh yeah having yeah being unwell following eating food uh, I, I was concerned that oh yeah first of all it's yeah thank you very much to the team for all your hard work you clearly you're under resourced and you're, you're struggling to recruit people because of the the bigger the bigger picture at the moment but i was particularly concerned that we don't know when we're going to get on top of the the large backlog uh, that we have, uh, and also of concern is it's it's this team that, uh, as we heard, deals with infectious diseases, uh, which is a uh, pretty topical at the moment. So yeah, I, I hope uh, we can get on top of uh, the situation because yeah, I, I'd say it's pretty pretty dire reading the report, and we yeah for our residents need need to get on top of this and make sure that when people are going out to eat, they're they're, they're not going to get poisoned basically thank you it's always right to be concerned about things like this councillor white and, and you're entirely right that the great challenge is around recruitment of staff uh it's a difficult jobs market hopefully we'll get some people in i think apprenticeships are going to be the way forward in a great many roles around the council we need to grow our own and offer opportunities for people in reading because it's just become all that much harder to get sort of trained experienced staff and I think I'm sure I wouldn't speak for the environmental health team and, and Ms Heath may wish to come back in but I'm sure it's exactly what they want to do is get out there and inspect establishments and help them to be better you know I'm sure no one's in it to go and close uh, you or I's favourite kebab shop which may be the same place may be distinct um, but to, to help these establishments and the sheer growth in the amount of food service outlets in Reading in recent years has been astronomical. I mean, it really is quite a striking product uh, of the pandemic, trends that were in existence before the pandemic as well, but we have all become much bigger consumers of takeaway food. And that's the kind of effect and the pressure, it creates a pressure within the system here in the council. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wanted to come back on there? Um, I guess just to try and um, in relation to the, the zero to two rated premises, um, I did send you um, the list earlier. 
there are a number of premises on there um, but in accordance with our enforcement um, policy and kind of the food law code of practice we do try our very best to revisit all of those premises that do present a serious concern and if um, on finding a premises with an, an imminent risk to, to public health we do have powers that we do you to, do use uh, to close that premises for the duration that it presents an imminent risk which um, may have um, been the case for some of the, the zero rated premises obviously once they have resolved that imminent issue um, unless the business um, requests that they have a new food hygiene rating that rating doesn't necessarily increase it stays the same um, but the food law code of practice does require us to um, undertake follow-up work in relation to the the premises that are not broadly compliant which is the zero to two range um, with your concerns regarding the um the backlog in backlog of inspections that obviously is a number that doesn't really sit very well with our team either um i would very much like to be able to give you an accurate answer um but in addition to the proactive um, work such as inspections which we we obviously do have a large number of to complete we also have reactive work which you can't really plan for very well um, but we're getting through the premises as best as we can and we'll continue to do so thank you anybody else i think something we can keep an eye on councillor robinson yeah thank you chair um firstly a very big thank you to the officers for this report there's been an awful lot of work and effort that's gone into it i too um like my fellow councillor on uh, on my left have real concerns over the the backlog of inspections however fully understand the pressures the team are under um yes it would be great to have an indication as to when we are likely to get back on track but i uh, take what you just said and uh, certainly understand that that is not possible at this stage but certainly um, you know if you could explain what um, potential options you're looking at in terms of bringing more staff on to to assist and how that uh, marketing is going in terms of advertising for new roles thank you over to you uh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we, um, as mentioned in the report and by uh, Councillor McEwen, so we are actively recruiting at the moment. Um, we were, were at present carrying out some interviews for an apprentice post. We only have, we have one post vacant for an apprentice. We did try to recruit to that last year, but we were unable to find a successful candidate um, that accepted our offer, unfortunately. Um, however, we do have some, some promising um, applicants, which we've shortlisted. Um, last week and are conducting interviews this week. We have uh, two EHO posts uh, vacant at present. One is for a full time EHO um, and the other is for a part time fixed term contract EHO to backfill a member of our team that's been seconded to the uh, Arcus database project. Um, we have well, the, the job advert for that closed yesterday. Uh, we have a number of applicants however the majority of those do not have any qualifications which would enable them to carry out the work of the team there are a small number that have a qualification which is not um, one that enables them to practice as an environmental health officer but nevertheless have some promising qualifications which could be utilized within the team um, so we're considering those persons for a technical officer position as opposed to the EHO post um, those are the only vacant posts that I have confirmation and ability to fill at present um, and I'm afraid I'm not able to do anything else without any more posts. Thank you. Any more? Councillor Thompson? I mean I just wondered and I realise as ever money is short if I mean, this is maybe jumping the gun, but if it does turn out that there aren't any suitable applicants to for a full EHO post, if it's possible, is would it be possible to look at the the package that's being offered? If it's possible to attract suitable applicants, I know occasionally that's done elsewhere. It's always possible to put in a case for a market supplement, 
uh, and we you know that'd be considered through the usual kind of HR processes if that's necessary. Any more? Councillor McEwen? Um, no, just to say um, thanks again to Katie for um, answering the questions from colleagues. And as others have mentioned, I think it's really important that we do address this um, backlog and hopefully we'll recruit some staff and hopefully that will solve the issues. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm guessing nobody's uh, averse to agreeing the draft statutory food service plan. No, so we're agreeing that unanimously. Great, and it's something we'll keep an eye on as we move forward. I'm sure. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and that moves us on to item eight, elections 2023. I assume Mike is presenting it. There we go. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, bring this report. Uh, back to um, a policy committee and to council's attention uh, really just to uh, feed back on the uh, voter identification issue which we had at the uh, borough elections in May because it was a, a very significant um, event really for us in terms of organizing the elections this year. It, it did cause considerable worry in advance about how it was going to go and a lot of effort went into uh, training the staff and trying to um, make, sure, make sure that our communications with electors in, in Reading was as good as it possibly could be to raise awareness of everything. And so it just felt right to report back with the limited information which the Electoral Commission is allowing us to disseminate locally with the details of what we think happened um, at the at the elections. I have to say what we think happened because we don't actually have a really complete set of um, data about how many people didn't uh, get to vote this year because of this uh, this new introduction. Um, I'll just talk a bit more about that in, um, in, in one minute. The, the other thing that uh, I wanted to alert councillors to was the fact that it's not just the voter ID which has happened this year. We've got other changes coming and they, they will also have an effect and we won't really know. Um, we won't really know what to expect, except um, I think there will be an awful lot of work in the electoral services team in order to make sure that we're prepared for all these changes so that we can um, anticipate the fact that more detailed work and plenty more communication uh, will have to take have to take place. So looking at the the figures there, it's difficult to um, ascertain anything from the, the turnout figures. Obviously, councillors will be aware that these figures fluctuate from year to year and a lot of uh, a lot of what people feel uh, they want to come out and vote for is influenced by issues other than um, local issues they are influenced by national issues. And so we can't really uh, pinpoint uh, voter ID as being anything which is um, very, very significant just from those figures alone, though it was um, rather disappointing to note that we had a slightly lower turnout than some previous years. The numbers then that I've indicated in paragraphs 3 and uh, 3.6 and 3.7 are that we had uh, 73 people who presented at the desk for a ballot paper and were initially declined and were asked to then go home and get some further identification but didn't come back. 197 uh, did go home and come back and were able to vote but 73 didn't and that's in percentage terms a small number 0.3 percent but I have to say I wouldn't like 73 people to be crowded into this room saying where, where was my vote I didn't get to vote. And anecdotally, um, uh, when we went round to the polling stations, you know, we met one or two of those people and they were upset and disheartened. So it was, um, you know, it, 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 it wasn't without impact, the fact that people came to the, uh, the polling station diligently um, to present themselves and to vote in the way that they, uh, they would expect to and then weren't able to vote. So that's not something that we want to take um, lightly. So, um, you'll see that um, the Electoral Commission is doing some um, research on this and they're going to publish their full report 
um, shortly. So in terms of um, what we've learned from voter ID, we've learned that it's necessary to um, supplement the uh, communications which were provided nationally. Um, they will still maintain that publicity uh, campaign up until the general election. We know that the impact at a local election will be magnified um, at a UK parliamentary election. And so we have to learn uh, this is see this as being a dry run really for a much bigger election which is to come. We've um, got some soundings out with some of our voluntary organisations about the impact um, and that can only ever really be that can only really be anecdotal evidence about what how people are feeling the effects of, of voter ID and perhaps leaders to um, consider whether or not we need to do any further targeted work with communities or um, particularly in the in the communications and in the lead up to an election to see what else we can do to uh, help people understand how they can get a voter authority certificate if they're eligible to vote are they on the register etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's still um, a lot of work uh, to do there with voter id particularly in the run-up to the parliamentary um, election so just to touch then on some of the other issues which are going to uh, come at the council in the next couple of years as a result of the Elections Act. There's been a change to the uh, overseas voters provisions, whereas before there was a 15 year limit. Now um, that's going to be removed. The numbers of overseas electors registering to vote does sort of, uh, you know, it does wane and wax and wane depending on the issues that um, people want to vote about. So for the referendums and the parliamentary elections, they do tend to go up. We just don't know what the effect is going to be by the 15 year limit um, being removed. And we don't know the administrative uh, hassle it's going to involve in trying to link electors who've long since left Reading back to a, an address in Reading and what that means in terms of the guidance and the regulations about the proof and the process that you need to go through. So there will be a, an administrative burden there um, on the council. The new parliamentary boundaries, since I've um, written the report and sent it for dispatch, that those recommendations were sent to Parliament by the uh, Boundary Commission for England. So it was as expected. The three new, the three new uh, boundaries. So our new election, new general election, will be um, with uh, Reading being split three ways. Our borough being split three ways. The majority in the Reading constituency, and then Church. Ward and Whitley Ward um, electing with uh, Woking and Boroughs and then um, Kentwood, Norcott and Tilehurst electing with some West Berkshire um, Boroughs. Uh, postal vote applications. There's an interesting number which I didn't actually get to put in the report because it only came to my attention um, in the last week or so. Um, every year you might be aware that um, we have to follow up on anybody who isn't able to vote by post successfully because um, they haven't signed the document or the, they've mismatched the date of birth and their, or, or the, the day that they're voting. They've, 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 in some way, they haven't been able to complete the identifiers. This year, that was 420, which is about double what it usually is. And there's no real, um, we're not really quite sure why that is. Um, but you'll note that postal vote applications now um, coming in online shortly will be a process whereby people will have to go through electronically and re-register and upload signatures. That might knock out some of those people who find it difficult um, to vote by post, but then that might have an effect as well on the number of people who feel able to take part in the election if they're not able to vote by post successfully. I'm thinking here perhaps of some older voters. Um, and then we've got um, the administrative burden again back on the council of ensuring we can help people manage that online process and what are we going to do to engage with those older people who perhaps find it difficult, perhaps they're um, in a care home, perhaps we'll see an increase in, in proxies. So again, there's further work there that we shall need to do to make sure that people aren't um, losing their votes. The last thing um, I just wanted to mention um, was about the EU voting and candidacy rights changes. And I know that council is obviously aware of this because there was a motion at um, council last week. And I have laid around um, some data in case, extra data in case you find it helpful, which has got the number of um, European voters broken down by the polling district. So you can see on the back page that that's about 13,000 
um, electors there who will need to be processed over the course of um, that year in 2024 to make sure that we've got the right people still on the register. Obviously, it's a key feature of the electoral services team's work and the annual canvas that they're used to making sure that people are on the register. But again, that's an additional burden um, falling on the council. So I just wanted to bring these issues to uh, councillors uh, attention and I think it's appropriate to report back in the future again about how these are progressing and whether we see there's any particular um, issues on the borough. Thank you. Councillor Terry. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think we, we said before, didn't we, because normally have a report at Council after the elections that we would bring a further report here because of the significant changes. And, and just to make sure that, you know, it's important that we do scrutinise and, and pay attention to these figures. Now, um, Mr Graham said that, you know, I think he refers to it as slightly lower than previous years, but well, I don't know, 2% starting to get a bit significant in terms of, you know, statistics. So we can see here a picture of falling uh, numbers in terms of turnout. Um, and it is concerning to see that this was the lowest of all. So whilst it's difficult to draw a straight correlation between that and the new uh, uh, requirements, um, mm, I would suggest that we might want to be concerned about that and we need to do some more to make sure that everybody can vote if they want to vote and are not disenfranchised by things that come in without uh, perhaps sometimes enough time and resources. Now, we were fortunate that we did get some additional resources to help us work the polling stations and generally speaking, we can say that we think our staff handled that very well but clearly there's a lot of data that we don't know and a lot of data we're not getting shared with so I'd suggest that I will keep an eye on this and speak to Mr Graham later in the year when we know the analysis that comes out from the Electoral Commission to see whether that throws up anything else that might need our attention in terms of making sure that Reading residents are not disenfranchised and are able to exercise their democratic oh. Uh, rights here in this is this country um, so you know I welcome the report I think there are other things for us to be perhaps concerned about in the future Royal Mail being one of them so you know quite a lot of things rely on people getting things through the post and there is some you know anecdotal evidence that certainly in town I think colleagues have mentioned to me of people were not getting posts in a normal prompt way and we might need just to consider that even in terms of actually the household um, fund Stuff, the stuff going out in the post, making sure that it's arriving in a timely fashion and that that doesn't have any implications. And again, as Mr Graham said, I think we'd all agree that we dealt with some of the other matters about EU voting. I mean, your home, your vote stuff when we had the motion to council just two weeks ago. Um, but we might want to discuss some of that again, but I'll leave that to colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Terry. Nobody else indicating. Councillor Gittings. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak on on this item, and, and thanks, Mr. You know, for the very comprehensive report, from Mr. Mr. Graham. Actually, and I, I think it is a bit concerning. I mean, I've looked at these two percent reductions. This is concerning because you're right to highlight boundary changes, and, and the next general election is going to be a vitally important general election for the future of the country. And it's it's a fair bet on current polling and looking analysis that the that at least two of the three Reading seats. That are affected will be highly marginal seats so absolutely every vote will count so 73 people being turned away because they haven't got voter identification other people not turning up you know doubts over the, the effectiveness of the postal service i mean this actually could have a crucial effect on that general election and my god do we need a general election so i, I just think these measures were frankly let's let's be the voter suppression actually this is this is a, this has been a sledgehammer to crack and that regard some of the requirements of, of identification and okay in Reading we, we, it was very well managed extremely well managed and I'm grateful for that but at, at its heart it's denied some people the right to vote and as I say in a general election coming up with everything at stake two marginal constituencies within the Reading area this could actually have an impact so I just think people need to reflect upon that and let's hope people are able to manage to vote get their ID get their postal votes in because it's really vitally important and we need to strengthen democracy, not weaken it. That was the that was the message from our from from full council last week when we moved that excellent motion. And I think, to be fair, all councils support that, actually. But it is the government that have introduced these measures. And I think they've caused an unnecessary amount of work for councils over over a problem that didn't actually really exist. Voter fraud, voter identification. 
You'll recall as well, Councillor Gittings, that we actually had a motion at full council that was opposed to the introduction of photo ID for voting and had cross-party support, although not unanimous cross-party support, I will admit. Um, and so it is a shame to have seen this introduced and we were all concerned that it would have the effect of suppressing turnout, making it more difficult for some people to vote. I think that probably is what's happened and even one person who's denied their vote because they weren't able to acquire the correct ID in time is a travesty. A democracy should make things as easy as possible for people to get to the polling station and vote. I think the effect will be more pronounced in a general election than it is in a local election. We know that fewer people vote in local elections and they are more motivated voters. They are more likely to have the right ID and so on. Even so, we can see a decrease in turnout. I think the effect will be more notable when we reach the general election, presumably next year or possibly as late as January 2025. I know that Councillor Robinson is very much looking forward to it. Um, I, I should note, I mean, it, it's a tedious point, but actually uh, the new parliamentary boundaries, we should acknowledge that because they were drawn on the old ward boundaries, the pre-2022 ward boundaries, and actually a small part of what is today Redlands Ward, a small part of what is today Battle Ward, um, and a small part of what is today Southcote Ward end up in constituencies other than the remainder of their wards. So a bit of Southcote and a bit of Battle end up in uh, mid Berkshire or Reading West mid Berkshire and a bit of Redlands ends up in the early and Woodley constituency. So we're gonna have some confusing polling districts to deal with as well and some administrative difficulties that come from that, although we do have those under the current boundaries. So I know the electoral services team will be well prepared to deal with it. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Graham, for this report. It's very interesting. And you mentioned just at the end about the postal votes that um, were found to have some kind of fault in. And that was 420, you said, which was double than usual. Do you have or are you able to find out um, anything more about that if these were first time postal voters or is that information maybe not available? But that's actually quite a large number of votes to go astray. I, I don't have any further information available at the minute. It is a feature of all um, uh, elections that um, you will have some people who've attempted to vote by post and then um, it, the their, their form A hasn't been acceptable, so they, they're, they're, it isn't taken forward with their, their vote. And what we have to do is write to them and then advise them that that's happened. So then they may well be able to update their personal identifiers or they may well think, well, I can't vote successfully by post because perhaps they've become too infirm. They can't write the signature properly. They get a proxy. Um, it's it's difficult to know in each individual case what's happening. Um, and and you know, people may not take up the advice that they're, that they're offered, so it's not necessarily doesn't necessarily follow through that the the letter re resolves the situation. I don't know the statistics. The number of people we're often told who fill out to today's date rather than their date of birth on Form A is quite striking, even though it is pre-populated with a 19 for anybody who was born in the 20th century. Anyway. Uh, I assume you were born in the 20th century, Councillor Terry. I don't know. You can, you, uh, if if Councillor Page were here, I'd have a joke about how his were predated with an 18. But there we are. Um, but good. Anybody else? No. Councillor Robinson. Ah, good. I tried to goad you. I'm glad you. Yeah, you were expecting me to say something. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Graham, for uh, for your report. Um, I completely agree with my fellow councillors, 73 people is 73 too much. Um, you know, for me, I, I praise uh, the team that uh, managed the elections here in, here in Reading. Um, you know, there was adequate publicity, not only on the TV, but locally, I believe to, you know, to correctly inform people of the requirements and if you think about it, we are not the first country to do this. There are so many throughout Europe that have voter ID requirements, including Northern Ireland. So this is something that, um, you know, we are following suit with other like-minded uh, like countries. So, 
you know, for me, it is regrettable. 73 is too much. Um, and I certainly hope that in future, you know, we will not have such numbers uh, coming through and that, uh, you know, people will pay heed to the, the advice and the, the new requirements as they stand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. I would generally say that just because lots of other countries have voter ID doesn't mean that Britain, which has a long and proud heritage of not having voter ID, should have to follow suit. You know, we, we should be proud of those things which characterise the success of our democracy over a great many years. I'll just remind you to turn your mic off as well. Um, anybody else? Councillor Hoskin? I think it's worth making the point that that number could fall because people just don't attempt to go and vote in the future because they do not have their idea. I mean, I met three separate people on election day and counts, uh, three separate people just bumped into them who said, I can't be going to vote because I just don't have the ID. Now, I spoke to them about like, getting it through the council and all the rest of it, but it seemed very complicated. And I just worry about people just thinking it's just too much faff and effort in a way it didn't used to be. So they, that number may fall in terms of people being turned away, but that's only because they don't attempt to vote in, in the first place. Anybody else? No. We were okay to note the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Moves us on to item nine, the Q4 performance report, and the director of finance already bringing himself up to the front. Um, so, good evening. This report presents the provisional year-end position for the 22-23 financial year. In the last year, all councils experienced inflationary cost pressures at a level not seen in decades, but I'm happy to say that Reading Borough Council remains financially stable. I'll briefly summarise the position contained in the various sections in the report. In terms of general fund revenue, we ended the year with a net positive variance of £4.2 million. The overall position includes a positive variance of 237k on adult care and health services, and a negative variance of £1.2 million on economic growth and neighbourhood services, almost half of which relates to ongoing shortfalls in off-street parking income post-COVID. Brighter Futures for Children ended the year with an overspend of £3.7 million. They're proposing to fund circa 900k of this through the use of their reserves, and the company has written to RBC requesting that policy committee agree to fund the remaining £2.845 million, as shown in recommendation 10 in this report. Representatives from Brighter Futures are here tonight if the committee has any questions. The overall positive variance of £4.2 million assumes that this request is approved. There are £0.281 million of carry forward requests as detailed in Table 9, and the report recommends that half a million pounds of the remaining £3.9 million surplus is transferred to a new hardship fund, and that the remaining balance of £3.4 million is transferred to the Capital Financing Smoothing Reserve to support the funding of the capital programme in line with the recommendation previously agreed by Policy Committee in March. If approved, general fund reserves will be £76 million as at 31st of March 23. The reserve movements include a total net transfer to reserves of £7.4 million from service and corporate budgets, offset by the budgeted drawdown of £19.9 million of COVID-19 grants released to fund previous collection fund deficits. The approved housing revenue account budget assumed a drawdown from reserves of 2.154 million. The provisional outturn position actually requires an actual net drawdown of 2.022 million, a positive net variance compared to budget of 132K. The HRA reserve balances at 31st of March 23 is £37.9 million. Pounds. In terms of ge general fund capital programme, expenditure for the year was £59.1 million pounds against a budget of £74.4 million. This expenditure included almost £21 million on leisure centres 
8.7 million on schools and 5.2 million on roads. Section 6 of the report proposes further amendments to the approved capital programme, which will result in a budget of £134 million pounds for 2023-24. Recommendations 12 and 13 request scheme and spend approval for a number of small capital schemes as detailed in tables 11 and 12. Our HRA council housing stock benefited from £30 million pounds of capital investment in the year, including £14 million spent on building new homes, £10 million on repairs to the existing stock, and £1.9 million on zero carbon projects. Recommendation 14 requests amendments to the HRA capital programme that will result in a budget for 23-24 of almost £56 million. Pounds. We had a savings target for 22-23 of £10.2 million, pounds, made up of £8.2 million pounds of in-year savings and £2 million rolled forward from the previous year. A total of £7.4 million of savings were delivered in-year, with the remaining £2.8 million being carried forward for delivery in 23-24. Council tax collection rates have improved to 96.07%, an increase of more than 0.4% from the previous year, and they're now almost back to the level delivered in 2019-20. Business rates collection has improved by more than 1% compared to last year, but is still more than 1% behind pre-pandemic levels. Section 13 of the report details performance against corporate plan targets and measures. The corporate plan includes 58 corporate plan measures and table 19 shows performance with 41 rated as green, 9 amber and 7 red. Table 20 provides a commentary around the 7 red measures. The corporate plan also details 52 key projects and table 21 shows the current status with 35 green, 16 amber and 1 red. Finally, policy committee is recommended to approve the debt write-offs as set out in Appendix 9 of the report. Thank you very much, Director. Councillor Terry. Thank you, Sorry, thank you, Chair. So I guess in terms of sort of a bit of an end of year report, I mean, I think I might kind of put us in a bit of an A plus, really. I mean, I think a net positive variance in the current circumstances is to uh, to be noted and to, to note that we're doing so well. Um, Mr Carter has gone through the report in some detail. So I think there's still some notable things. I would like to congratulate adult social care. I mean, a net positive position at the end of year is not something we've experienced for a little while. So I think we need to say well done to them in terms of managing their budget, although we did give them some more money to make sure that they did manage their budget. And uh, sorry to sort of note, really, that Brighter Futures for Children, unfortunately, this time, for the last few years, has been able to manage within its contract sum, um, with a few variants, but this time it doesn't appear to have been able to do so. And we need to understand better why that's happened. We understand there are pressures in the system, the cost of living and everything else, but we needed to work out how much of that is the pressure and how much of that are about things that we could do better to make sure that we're controlling the budget. And I'm sure that those that work will will go ahead. Um, so all in all, we've got in front of us a, a, a good and strong position, but not without its challenges as we go forward. And we all know that we have achieved a great deal of our savings, but not all of them. And they'll have to roll forward just in terms of, you know, the corporate plan. A plan is a plan, not something you're definitely going to deliver, but it's your ambition and your intention. And we've done quite well, but maybe not got everything done that we would have liked to have done. So, I mean, I think overall we can we can note and say that we've done well. Um, I did want to, I've got a chair just to, to indulge me really that I have access to another report going to audit and governance next week. Um, and I just think in terms of our financial management, you know, it's something that we under scrutiny and needs to be noted. You know, in terms of uh, treasury management, we've managed to in the last year avoid 8.1 million pounds of costs in terms of an external interest. Lots of worries about interest rates that have gone up and lots of concerns about the impact it will have and no doubt still will have on us in this current year but it's great to see that our staff are really watching how we you know what we need to borrow when we need to borrow and doing that in such a way which was set out in the report audit and governance will see that means we can limit our exposure to those interest rates and keep those costs down and in fact Mr Carter has mentioned a few times I think in reporting to us 
that internally some more controls have been put in place in terms of the capital program board which has looked and scrutinized very carefully at our ambitions to deliver things through our capital program for getting our timing right you know and making sure that they're planned well and deliver um, on time and as a result of that we've got a, a net positive position and, and that also means that we've saved something like 3.5 million of uh, costs of borrowing so I think it's to really, be you know commend our staff for the work they're doing the scrutiny that goes on and that we all do that puts Reading in the position that many authorities are very envious of thank you chair thank you councillor Terry councillor White thank you chair and yes, it, it is good that the council is on a stable financial footing. Uh, and it wasn't too many years ago, it, things weren't quite so stable and things were a little bit shaky, I think it is fair to say. Uh, not wishing to rain on your parade too much, uh, Councillor Terry, but as well as the finances, there's also the performance monitoring uh, and the, the corporate, corporate uh, objectives. Uh, I was look, looking down the, the table in one of the appendices, I think it was. Uh, I think the climate change, climate emergency strategy was only showing as an amber on the red, amber, uh, green uh, uh, order of things. Uh, some of the actions are at risk. Uh, in education, key stage one and two results uh, aren't as good as they should be in the report that's going to ACE. Uh, it, it's described as Reading performed poorly. Uh, number of affordable homes delivered uh we've we've missed our target on that and our target isn't particularly particularly positive number of rough sleepers our target is eight and we're up at 36 which is some way we've missed that target by by some margin uh, and to, to finish the number of residents uh, that think the council is value for money uh that we've missed our target on that it's a, only only 47 percent uh, but, but yes, it's good that we're on a sounder financial footing than we were. It's good and right and proper that some of those things will be scrutinised in committees like ACE. It's also good and right and proper that we would set ourselves ambitious targets. It would be quite a lamentable state of affairs, wouldn't it, Councillor White? And I think you would say that we weren't ambitious enough if we set targets, which we absolutely could, that we knew we were going to meet all year, every year. Maybe we should shift, maybe we should move over to it. On affordable homes, I suppose perhaps if the Green members of the planning committee actually voted for some affordable homes there might be a few more delivered but i guess not because you're just an inconsequential irritation in that committee anybody else <laughs> councillor robinson thank you chair um being a positive individual as i am congratulations um, it's a great position to be in when you look at other councils like our neighbours in Slough, for instance. Um, you know, it's it's something that is worthy of praise. So um, I will certainly be happy to, um, you know, approve the recommended action on this particular report. And thank you um, to the officers and the, the lead councillor for all the work uh, done in putting this forward for uh, for policy this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, just to echo um, the thanks uh, for the detailed report. Uh, since um, I think you, uh, Mr Carter, mentioned in his introduction that there are uh, representatives of Brighter Futures present, um, would it be possible for them just to speak very briefly uh, as an outline of um, what they feel went wrong for them financially in this current year? Probably to hear from Brighter Futures a question for another time and place yeah, and okay. there will be opportunities but if yeah, Mr yeah. Carter wanted to pick up I think some of the discussions I know he has had with colleagues in yeah. Brighter Futures. Yes so uh, Brighter Futures have actually commissioned an independent audit to understand what went wrong uh, last financial year. That audit is due to report back by the end of this week, I think it is, and uh, that will be shared with Reading Borough Council as soon as it's available. Um, I also attended the last meeting of the Finance Committee uh, for Brighter Futures, where we went through uh, the year-end position and the forecasts for the new financial year. I think 
it's safe to say that the process so far has identified some weaknesses in some of the forecasting tools that were being used in Brighter Futures. So my team are working with colleagues from Brighter Futures at the moment to strengthen those forecasting tools and to make sure that we'd, any service can overspend, any children's service can overspend. The problem we had with last financial year was the movement in the forecast overspend very late in the year. And that's something that we need to avoid in future to make sure that those controls are owned not just by the finance team, any good organisation that's managed well financially. The financial information is jointly owned by the operational service and the finance team. And I think that needed to be strengthened, but it has been strengthened already as a result of conversations that we had. So I don't want to prejudge the outcome of the independent audits, but that's my thoughts at the moment on what I know. But when we know more, when we've got the independent audit report, then we'll be able to make sure we put in place a really robust action plan. Worth saying, so I know the chief executive wants to come in. The, if the, the, the costs of care placements have increased and we know that this would happen. We know that there's inflationary pressures happens in adult social care as well. You can account for that. But of course, what is much more difficult to account for uh, individual, very high cost placements, children who come into the care system who need that um, package of care, which is considerable, but is nonetheless very high cost and does put a pressure on budgets. And that's a na nationwide issue as well, because you can't know when they will emerge. Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just to reiterate, just in terms of, by way of explanation, Mr. Carter's right to say that there is a review going on, but um, just to give you some assurance um, in terms of more specifics, um, uh, as the Chair has said, that two very high cost placements accounted for just shy of a million pounds of um, the that 1.8 million and then there were some um, inflationary pressures that hadn't been uh, reflected when the original budget was built that wasn't all of the uh, explanation for the overspend but a considerable amount yeah. councillor hoskin yeah, no, thank you. I think it's largely been said. I think it's when you look at the areas of overspend, it's very reflective of issues that are affecting children's first services across the entire country. The the specific issues around the forecasting and understanding of that at an earlier stage, which of course uh, Mr. Carter's explained some of the actions to ensure that that's addressed. Um, yes, if you you know speak to our council colleagues across the country, um, there will you know be a familiar line costs of high, high cost placements, which in this case was a substantial amount. Um, that's a major issue in terms of rising costs for children's services. Uh, the, uh, the agency staff, which is a you know, long term issue across across the country uh, as as to costs as um, home school transport as well. The three sort of main ones there um, as well. So, you know, the work to uh, forecast is important, but also I suppose to reassure that, that the work goes on to ensure that those costs are managed as effectively as possible uh, within the challenges that we, you know, we face. Thank you, Councillor Hoskin. Anybody else? OK, so ordinarily we'd take all of the recommendations in the open session with simply a confidential appendix. But for good reasons, as we'll see, I'm going to suggest that we take uh, one through to 14 in the open session. We'll go to the closed session to take the appendix. Uh, so is everybody OK with recommendations one through to 14? I'm detecting yes. Yes, unanimous. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So because you don't have it printed in front of you, I'll move it by word of mouth that pursuant to Section 100A of the Local Government Act 1972, as amended, members of the press and public be excluded during consideration of the following items on the agenda, as it is likely that there would be disclosure of exempt information as defined in the relevant paragraphs of Part 1 of Schedule 12A as amended of that Act. We all agree to that. Wonderful. Closed session. If you could take us offline, please.